admins on. Okay, we're going to start with the next session, so if I can ask you all to take your seats, and we will continue on with uh, Debbie Kennett. So, um, Debbie uh, is a member of ISO. She also runs the uh, very popular Cruise News blog and is author of two books, DNA and Social Networking and the Surnames Handbook. She's Honorary Research Associate in the Department of Genetics, Evolution and Environment at University College London. And today, Debbie, Debbie is going to talk to us about autosomal DNA and how to make the most of it. So please give a warm welcome for Debbie Kennett. Can you all hear me at the back, first of all? Okay, that's good. Um, okay, I'm going to be doing a run-through this morning of some of the basics of autosomal DNA, um, but I'm going to be looking at some of the basic concepts um, so that you have an understanding and you don't go off in a wild goose chase, um, tracing, trying to make connections that just aren't there. And I'm also going to be looking at some of the tools that you can use that will help you with your research. Uh, now, all the slides for my presentation I've put up on um, Dropbox, so if you want to take a photograph of that link, you can then go and have a look at the slides. Any links that are in the slides, you can then click from the PDF file and uh, go and read up a little bit more on the subject. I think all the, a few more cameras still going. Okay, so it's actually a very, very exciting time to be a genetic genealogist at the moment because the market has just suddenly exploded in the last few years. This is my estimate of the number of people who've taken a DNA test um, for, for any reason, and I reckon that there are now something like 9 million people who've tested but 8 million of those people are actually in the matching databases. And genetic genealogy is all about going into a database, finding matches with your cousins, and then going back and doing the genealogy and working out how you're connected. So the bigger the database, the more chance that we have of uh, success. So I started back in 2007 when DNA was almost a dirty word. We had to try and... <laughs> We had to try and encourage people to take a test in the first place. It's a bit like the old days when, with computers, where genealogists were afraid of giving up their... Irish baby. 
baby, and the Irish parents went home with a Jewish baby. Um, now that's not going to happen to everyone, but I can guarantee that everyone that in this audience there are at least going to be a couple of people who are going to get surprises from DNA testing. Can I just ask, actually, before we go any further, how many people here have actually taken the DNA test? That's really impressive, so virtually everyone in the audience. And how many of you have tested with, um, have taken the autosomal DNA test? Virtually all of you. And which, how many have tested with Ancestry? How many have tested with Family Tree DNA? And how many with 23 Me? My Heritage? Living DNA? We, <laughs> I'm really impressed we've got a very uh, um, genetic genealogy savvy audience here today. Um, now the other thing I wanted to mention, the genetic genealogy standards, I recommend everyone has a read of these because these help to guide us first of all on what to expect from DNA testing but also um, how we actually share DNA results with people and the more that we, the more people we have in the database it's very important that we protect the privacy of the people in the databases. We don't give out the names of matches without consent. Anything that's private information to you from your match list is, should not be shared publicly. A lot of people do get carried away with their results and in their enthusiasm. They want to start sharing everything. But you have to do that with consent. So we now have a stage where we have five different testing companies. And I like to think of it rather like um, computers. At one time, we only had one way of accessing the internet. And when like, we first started, I had one computer for the whole house, and we all had to take our turns. Now we have, you know, everyone has a lovely desktop and a laptop. You might have a tablet, you've got a phone. We've got lots of different ways of accessing the internet. And now we've got lots of different companies offering DNA testing, all having their pros and cons. But as we've seen here, they all, it's, it helps to test with a number of different companies. And if you're looking to find a chance match, if you're trying to connect with you, the black sheep who went to America, for instance, you don't know which company they tested with, so you have to be in all the databases. Um, there are pro the, the Ancestry have the largest database now, uh, but Family Tree DNA have been testing in Ireland for much, much longer, and they've also been doing the Y DNA testing in Ireland right from the year 2000. So you will find people in the Family Tree DNA database that you simply won't find anywhere else. Some people who've passed away who couldn't possibly test elsewhere. And I would say that any serious genetic genealogist has to be at least in the Ancestry DNA and Family Tree DNA databases. And just to show how the market has expanded, the two new entrants, they only started, um, they only launched back in um, the autumn last year. So that's a really a good sign that the market is starting to take off. So there, it depends on what you want to get out of the test. There are, the, there are certain different things to consider. I'll be going through some of these uh, things as we go on with the talk. Um, now transfers is one of the important points to bear in mind. If you test with Ancestry, you can do the free transfer to Family Tree DNA. You have to pay $19 to unlock the rest of your matches. But um, Ancestry changed a new chip uh, back in, I think it was June last year, and anyone who's tested on the new chip who transfers, they now do not get speculative matches. So that means about 90% of your match list is not there if you do the transfer. So I think there are some advantages in having at least one family member do, making sure you've got one family member who's done a full test of family tree DNA. Um, and my heritage of the other company that also accept transfers, and you can do a free transfer there, they've not yet got their matching system sorted out, so I, I wouldn't rely on any of their matches, but it's worth at least being in there once they've got that sorted out, because they're particularly good on um, other European countries. They've got the website set up in, in lots of different languages, so that should help to uh, grow the database in, in other countries. But you can't do transfers into Ancestry or 23andMe. And Living DNA is supposed to be accepting transfers, but that hasn't happened yet. So um, just a little bit of the basic science. Um, within every cell in our body, we have um, 
uh, we have a, the, the centre of the cell is called the nucleus, and it's inside that nucleus where all the DNA is packaged up in these structures called chromosomes. And we each have 46 chromosomes, we get 23 from our mother, 23 from our father, and one set of those chromosomes are the sex chromosomes. So if you're a male, you have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. It's the Y chromosome that makes you a male. And if you're a female, you have two Xs. But the important feature about the autosomes is that before they are passed on, you're, um, they, they're going to go in a process of recombination. So the DNA that you get from your parents is a patchwork of the DNA that you get from your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and all in different proportions. And that means that you get representation from all of your ancestors, but it also makes it more difficult to try and work out what the connection is, because then rather than with the microbes, so you've just got the one straight line, the autosomal DNA, you've got to look at all your different ancestral lines. So to get the most out of autosomal DNA, you really need to do your genealogy research, and research every single line of your family tree, and you also need to hope that your matches have done the same. So this is how the inheritance process works. You get 50% of your DNA from your mother, 50% from your father. And then as we go back through the generations, um, with your grandparents, you get an average of 25% from each grandparent. But there is a variation around those averages. And you don't generally get 25% exactly from each grandparent. You will get more from one than you will get from another. So in, uh, the, on each side, it always adds up to 50%. So you might get 29% from one grandparent and 21% from the other. Um, and then as you go further back in time, that DNA is diluted. So if you've only got 21% from one of your grandparents, then on that line, you're going to have much less DNA going back through the generations. So the average is 12.5% for great-grandparents. And then once you get back to about six generations, you start to have ancestors with whom you will not share any DNA. They start to drop off your genetic family tree, they're still on your genealogical family tree, but you just don't have that DNA anymore. But of course, if you test other family members, it may be that your sibling has a different mix of DNA and they will have the, the representation of that ancestor that you don't. So this is what DNA looks like in a chromosome browser. This is a feature that family tree DNA have, which ancestry don't. Um, which and, and I think most serious genetic genealogists really enjoy having this chromosome browser feature. I find it really helpful just to visualise the matches and what they look like. Um, so this is my son compared with me and my husband, and you can see that across every single chromosome, he's got one entire chromosome from me, one entire chromosome from his father. This is my son compared with his maternal grandparents. And you can see here how the DNA has been chopped up. So that on um, some chromosome one there, he's got a little bit of orange from his um, grandfather, and then the rest of the blue part of that chromosome is from his grandmother. And then if you go down to um, one of these chromosomes there, I can't see the number from here, but it, in one case, he's inherited the entire chromosome from his maternal grandmother and nothing from his maternal grandfather. And once that DNA is gone, it's lost forever on in, in that one individual. And then once we get out to third cousins, there's just a few blocks of DNA shared. And then once you get out to fifth cousins, sixth cousins, you would only expect to share one block of DNA if you're going to share DNA at all. Now the companies all have, they all provide different figures. They don't explain very well where they get these figures from. But this is the, the, what they reckon um, we can expect if we test with them and our chances of actually having a match. So if you test um, you and the second cousin, you would expect to match that second cousin. Um, we have not yet had a proven case of second cousins testing um, who do not match each other. So if, but if you test a second cousin you don't match, you both need to go back and start asking some awkward questions of your other family member to try and find out what's gone wrong there. But with third cousins, there are some genuine genetic third cousins who will not show up as a match. And then as we go further out, the chances of actually um, showing up as a match start to diminish quite rapidly. Because it may be 
you've got to first of all inherit the DNA from those more distant ancestors, which is the first point, but then you also have to inherit DNA on the same chromosome and on the same part of that same chromosome. So if you've got a bit of your great 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 grandparent on chromosome one and your cousin has got a bit of that grandparent on chromosome nine, you've both got DNA from him but you both show up as a match. Now with DNA testing it really helps to test as many people as possible. In my ideal world, every single person would test and we would have all our genealogical pro problems solved. But I think that is not likely to happen. Um, we can but dream. But um, the priority should always be the oldest generations. Get them into the databases while you have the chance. If you can, if you can test your parents, do so. Some people are able to test grandparents. If you can't test your parents, um, you may have one parent and you can then test aunts and uncles on the other side. And siblings um, are very helpful, if, especially if you don't have parents to test because they get a completely different mix of DNA. You've lost, we only get 50% of, of the parents' DNA, so they could have a different part of that 50% in their, their mix. And I also think it's very useful just to understand the process. If you can test your parents, also test yourself. If you can't test your parents, if you've got a partner and children, just at least have a trio. So you've got a parent, child, a parent, two parents and a child, because I think that really helps you to understand how the inheritance process works. And then the other people that we want to test are the first and third cousins. That gives you the maximum representation. The second cousins seem to be the ones who are best because that's the sort of sweet spot where you're guaranteed a match um, and it helps you to narrow them down the line much, much uh, to, to one in eight rather than one in four. And with autosomal DNA, always start with the known, work out to the unknown. If you have a framework of known relatives that you've tested, it will set you in really good stead for the, map, the more distant matches. If you, if you test yourself and a first cousin, and then you match a fourth cousin who also matches that first cousin, then you can, you've got a much better chance of identifying where you share the common ancestry. Now, when, it's important to consider the limitations, first of all, of our genealogical research and also of the, um, of the genetics. Uh, now, most people, I would imagine, unless they're adopted, can, they, they know who their parents are, they know who their grandparents are. And can, even with, without doing any family history research, they can probably name all four grandparents. Once we start doing our research, we can probably identify our great-grandparents, our great-great-grandparents, and probably some people in this room can identify all 32 great 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 grandparents great 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 grandparents. How many people can actually identify every single person at that level? Four hands went up. So once we go up to the next level, can, can, can you still identify all 64 great 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 grandparents? <laughs> I'm most impressed. <laughs> but I would say that that level is probably the limit of genealogical research. Um, if you are really lucky and really dedicated, even if you are, I've got an illegitimacies in my family tree which I can't get through at the moment, so I can't identify all those people. I've got lots of holes in my tree and you're, you can guarantee your matches are going to have holes as well. So this does impact, um, first of all, on how we interpret the matches, because if you have a, a match with someone, you need to be in to, some people have trees that collapse on themselves. So not everyone is going to have 64 great, 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 great grandparents. Some people have cousins who marry um, and they will have a reduced number of ancestors. So that makes it more complicated interpreting the matches. But you have, so you then will have to be sure that if you have a match with someone, that you are matching on the line that you've identified from your genealogical research and not from a different line that you haven't yet researched or they haven't yet researched. And as we go further back in time, uh, this is something we have to take into account as well. The number of, it's actually the structure of the ancestral population. So those 64 um, of that generation, when we go back one further generation, 
we have 128 ancestors. Once we go back 10 generations, we have one, over 1,000 ancestors. And if we keep going back 15 generations, 32,000 ancestors. At 20 generations, we all have one million ancestors, which is just a mind-boggling figure. And 20 generations isn't actually that far back. And at 30 generations, we're up to one billion. And this is where we have something which is called the ancestor paradox. So this is me, these are my ancestors. I have one billion ancestors from about 30 generations ago, which is around about 1080. Every other person in this room, you all have a billion ancestors in that time frame, but the historical population of the world at that time was 295 million. So you can see what's happened. There's been a huge, we're all essentially related to everyone else. So I can guarantee that I am related to every single person in this room. I may be your 10th cousin, I may be your 13th cousin, I may be your 20th cousin. Um, and there are all sorts of um, relationships between every single person in this room that we will never identify through genealogical research. Um, so now this does have an impact on the, on the genetics, and this is Winston Churchill's family tree. Um, there's a very uh, nice tool that Brad Lyons has produced, where if you've got a GEDCOM file, and if you do have this pedigree collapse in your tree, you can upload your GEDCOM file and you can visualise the amount of pedigree collapse. So this is only ancestors he's able to identify, that they've been able to identify, but you can see how the tree, once you get back into this medieval era, all of, everyone's related to everyone else. And I would say that's probably typical, certainly of most English trees that I look at. It. This pedigree collapse starts to occur back in that medieval era. Um, but in other populations, so this is all the US presidents, and they are all related to each other much more recently. So if we were to, if, say, if Barack Obama was to take a DNA test and Donald Trump was to take a DNA test, they would both be related to each other on multiple ancestral lines. So then the question arises, when you have a match, how do you know which of those many different lines they're actually matching on? So this means it's, a, it's very difficult to use autosomal DNA for distant matches, but it's much more effective for recent matches. So what do we mean by a match? So a match is a segment of DNA that is what is called identical by descent, which means it's been inherited without recombination from a common ancestor. Um, now, there are some limitations to the current test. We're not testing and sequencing the whole genome. We're only doing a sampling of markers across the genome. So that um, does present some limitations. And also, each company, they have their own algorithms. They have their um, different match thresholds. So you will sometimes find you get a match at one company that doesn't show up at another company. The count of centum organs, the unit we use to measure DNA, might be different from one company to another. And another problem, um, this is, again applies to the more distant matches, there are some small segments where the companies just can't measure those accurately at the moment. That's not just necessary limitation of the, threat, the algorithms, but also because we're not doing the, the whole sequence. And I just wanted to just say a word of warning because we do get some people who try and reduce the thresholds. At Family Tree DNA, you can go right down to one centum organ. But if you do that, you are in the danger zone and you, you will find you could, you could match every single person in the world if you set your threshold at one centum organ. Um, and you can just about make out on here, this is my son and the, the comparison with his grandparents. And um, you can see on here, if I lower the threshold to one centum organ, can you see little flecks there that appear um, in odd places? So in, on chromosome one, there's a little orange fleck that appears there on that blue section, which he's got from his um, grandmother. Now, you can't inherit DNA from two grandparents in that way. He's, he's, we know, we can see from the, the chart that he's got the, that whole long segment from the, the, the maternal grandfather. And so the, those small segments are generally just noise. Don't go down to five cm's. It's best to only focus on the segments that are at least over seven centum organs.
Um, now, the other thing is the age of segments. We can talk about having a match with someone and being identical by descent, but in actual fact, some of those matches can go back a surprisingly long way. Uh, the only good data that we have is from some simulations that um, in fact, some of my colleagues at UCL did, where they looked at the amount of sharing and they, they sort of ran these algorithms over and over again. And you can see that as the segments get smaller and smaller, the relationship could be actually very distant. So even if you have a match on, a, say, a 20 centimorgan segment, um, about 60%, about 40% of those will be well beyond um, 10 generations. So that's something else that you have to bear in mind. Um, that's, so um, again, it's best if you focus on the close matches and that's where you're likely to have the most success. And the other thing to watch out for are what are called pilot regions. Sometimes we find that um, what we would expect is to find that the matches are distributed evenly across our genome um, rather than say all large numbers of matches all piling up on chromosome 1 or chromosome 6. But when we get the results, we do find that there are these regions where we do get these pilots and lots and lots of people um, all matching on the same segment. And that there are just too many people matching for that to actually, that, share, that um, DNA to be shared through a recent genealogical relationship. Some of these are areas that have been prone to natural selection, so there are certain you know, things like um, lactose um, tolerance, which is very, very prevalent in Ireland. 90% of the Irish population have the uh, particular mark for lactose tolerance. So that sort of, that particular segment of DNA will have been conserved in the Irish population. So you probably find most Irish people will match on that particular um, part mm -hmm. of the genome. So Ancestry have filters that actually downweight these pileups, but the, the other companies don't have so many of those. So that, that's another thing to watch out for. You don't want to start drawing conclusions that you're related to someone when it happens to be on one of these regions where everyone is related. Um, now, I mentioned the advantage of testing parents and children. I've done some comparisons at Ancestry, Family Tree DNA, and MyHeritage, where I've got three parents um, where I can um, do those comparisons. And um, at Ancestry, 36% of my matches did not match either of my parents. Um, and at Family Tree DNA, 26% didn't match either of my parents. At MyHeritage, 71% didn't match either of my parents. Um, now, the, 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 the figures are somewhat misleading looking at it that way because at Ancestry, most of the matches that didn't match even my parents were on very, very small segments at 6 and 7 and 8 centimorgans. Family Tree DNA have a higher match threshold, um, so they wouldn't actually report those matches. But it's all, it was, it's, again, this is all on the very small segments. Um, my heritage, I don't know what they're doing with their matching. They, they need to sort it out because we have reports of people who aren't getting second cousins who match elsewhere that uh, aren't showing up. But uh, So the, the ones that don't match, these are all the speculative matches, the low confidence matches. Um, but, so this is just a word of caution about that level of sharings. And another reason just to focus on the close matches. We now have so many matches, we don't need to worry about the, the very distant matches in most cases anyway. Um, now for those, just for those of you who haven't tested, which most of you have, um, this is the Ancestry DNA homepage. I'm only going to focus on Ancestry DNA and Family Tree DNA um, for the rest of it. Um, so this is what you get at Ancestry DNA. Um, you get the, I don't have any DNA circles. How many people have DNA circles at Ancestry? Only a couple, right. And uh, I have my first new ancestor discovery. How many people have one of those? Oh, a few, right. Mine was not very helpful. It's somebody in South Carolina um, who I'm pretty sure I'm not closely related to, and this match does not show up in either of my parents' matches either, so uh, I don't think that's a real uh, helpful hint there. So this is what the match list looks like. Um, and one useful tip, I find these notes very, very useful at Ancestry. I record in there when I sent a message to someone, when they've replied. And then once you've got the notes in there, you can then just click on the notes to call up the details again without having to go and click through every time. And 
and Ancestry have some very useful filters. So if you've tested your parents, um, as I've done, you can actually filter your matches by the parents. Um, and the, I find the genetic communities are also a very useful filter. So I've got the two communities here, so I can search the matches within those communities. So those are the people that are more likely to um, have genealogical relationships with me. Um, about 90% I find of my match list across all the companies is in America. I don't have any recent ancestors who emigrated to America, so all those matches are very, very distant. And you can also look at the amount of shared DNA if you click through here at the competence level, and that gives you the, so that will allow you to do a check um, looking at other sources. So this is someone who is predicted to be a third cousin at Ancestry. Um, sharing 168 Centim organs, and it was actually a second cousin. And this is again where it was useful testing other family members. I tested my, my father um, and my mother, and my father was predicted to be a first to second cousin. Um, so that was in the, the, the range for first to second cousin, but the, the, the amount of sharing that ancestry allowed for second cousins, that was under that threshold. So none of these predictions are necessarily going to be completely accurate. There are always going to be variables, and it also a lot of that depends on the population as well. Um, Ancestry give you some confidence levels, and I would recommend only focusing on the matches that at least are um, good confidence, 16 to 30 septum organs. Um, they, they say good or moderate for a reason, um, because some of those matches, may, they may not be real, they may be so far back in time that you can't find the genealogical relationship. And the most useful feature of Ancestry are the leaf hints. Um, I've only got four of these at the moment, and two of those are with my parents, but when they do work, they work very well. And this, in both cases, for me, they identify the common ancestor. The disadvantage is that you have to have a subscription to make use of the features of Ancestry. So things like the leaf hints and the circles and the new ancestor discoveries and also the ability to access the trees of your matches, you only get that if you have the subscription. You can contact the match and you can ask them to share a tree with you, but you don't have the direct access to the tree yourself. So that's something to bear in mind at Ancestry DNA. And this is my homepage at Family Tree DNA. Um, and one of the real advantages of Family Tree DNA that I wanted to uh, plug are the projects. And there are a whole host of geographical projects. There's a large number of really wonderful Irish DNA projects, which you'll be hearing more about over this weekend. And the Swedish DNA project, we have Peter here who runs a Swedish DNA project. And we've got lots of regional projects for Ireland as well. Um, Cork and North of Ireland Family History Society run their own project. And um, if you are in a project, um, a lot of the admins of the project can often offer advice and help with the results or point you in the direction of useful resources. And some, like Paddy, will even actually welcome uh, project members when they come and visit uh, the country from overseas. Um, and Sean also will, uh, is doing a nice little study in, in Donegal over there. And when you're in a project, what you can do is you can actually search for matches within a project. So that's a useful way of filtering. Um, and the other thing with family tree DNA is they also offer Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA testing. So that means that you can um, coordinate the results of three different types of tests on one account. And I find it very useful to have the, the evidence, not just from autosomal DNA, but also from Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA wherever possible, because you, you'll, you can then be much further, you can reach your conclusions to be much more certain about them. And if you are going to embark on testing lots of family members, or if you have tested lots of family members, you can set up a project at Family Tree DNA to manage all those project members under one login, to say having to log into lots of different accounts. So even if you, you know, if you want to say test 10 family members, then that's well worth doing. And you can have it as a secret project, so it's not actually publicly revealed. This is what the match list looks like at Family Tree DNA. And they give you, um, if you've entered surnames, um, any matching surnames are um, they're, um, highlighted in bold there. And you have the benefit of the, the chromosome browser um, to look at the matches. And one of the things that I 
find useful, and a lot of people find useful, is actually looking at the, uh, the matches and trying to identify which particular segment came from which particular ancestor. And the more that you do this, the more you can build up a map, and it also helps to, um, when you get other matches coming in, to identify how you're related. So here, this again is a comparison with my son and his grandparents, and a match with a third cousin once removed. And you can see here, with, when that match comes in, it's just that one match there on chromosome 7, and we can see immediately that he's matching on his paternal grandfather's chromosome. So with that knowledge, we know exactly which branch of the family tree to look on. You don't have to do this, but it, it is, um, some people find it quite addictive. And just a, a, this is an example that I showed at Who Do You Think You Are Live, with the benefits of testing siblings. And in this case, it's a third cousin once removed who had, um, ma who had matched with two siblings. And the two siblings match each other as four siblings. But the first sibling, they only shared 15 centimorgans across two, um, two chromosomes there. Um, and that's the sort of match that probably um, you would think, oh, it's probably not worth bothering with, it's going to be very, very distant. And then when we did the comparison with the second sibling, they shared a much larger amount of DNA, uh, 93 centimorgans, and it was very clear there was a much closer relationship than you would have realised just by looking at the one sibling there. So this is an example of how testing more people can actually narrow down the possibilities of the, uh, of the relationships. Um, now one uh, very useful um, website I wanted to tell you about, or a tool that you can use, is the Shared CMs project, which is on the ISOF wiki page for autosomal DNA statistics. And the link is in, um, on the PDFs. And this is actually a, a study done by genetic genealogists, all submitting their data from all the different testing companies and trying to get a feel for the range of sharing for all the different degrees of relationship. And there's a really neat tool that's now been developed uh, from a, uh, this, this website, DNA Painter. How many people have tried to use this yet? That's right, so a lot of people, can, you can go home and have really good fun with this because what you can do, um, you enter in the amount of DNA that is shared. So in this case, I enter 168 CMs, which was that um, my second cousin relationship and ancestry predicted as a third cousin and it will give you the percentage of shared DNA, but then it will also give you the possible relationships. I spent a long time preparing slides in my talk at Who Do You Think You Are Live last year, and I did all this manually, and now it can be done at the touch of a, a button, so that you can see here it limits the range of relationships. So my second cousin relationship, the 168 CMs, is actually within, well within the range shown by the Shared CM project, and it would be a very high amount of sharing for a third cousin there. And if you are into doing all the chromosome mapping, you can do this on this website as well. They've got a whole load of wonderful tools. And you can, here's an, one of their example profiles. And this is all interactive. And if you click on, the, on a chromosome there, you can actually see which bits are shared. And it even identifies pilot regions for you. And then you can make notes on the, the segments there. Um, another useful tool is Kitty Cooper's chromosome mapper, where you have to enter the data manually. Um, but what you can do with this um, is also you can, if you have a, a couple where you've got lots of people tested, you can actually produce one of these snazzy maps showing which bits of DNA of that ancestral couple have been inherited by all the different cousins there. This is really for more advanced usage, but a lot of people do really like doing this uh, type of work. Uh, GEDmatch is a very useful website where, um, regardless of where you've tested, you can compare results. And they are now up to 650,000 users. Um, so if you've tested at um, Ancestry DNA and your cousin's tested at 23andMe, you can plug both results into here and do the comparisons. There is now a complication because some of the companies, Living DNA and 23andMe, are now using a different chip which is not compatible with the existing tests from the other companies. So they've now got this new um, uh, Genesis uh, database where you can do comparisons on the version 5 chip 
um, and I think some of the other companies will probably have to move over to that chip in the long run um, as well. Um, so GenMatch is free to use. Um, there's all these features and you can do, you can look at eye colour and you can do very detailed comparisons uh, between one person and another. Um, and the are your parents related to all the various other things. And there are various um, features that are at a, what looks called the tier one level. Um, I think it's five dollars a month. Um, probably most, most people aren't going to need those advanced tools, but they're for very, very um, experienced genetic genealogists. And this is the GenMatch Genesis database. Um, and eventually all the results are going to be merged into this uh, Genesis uh, database. And uh, you can get all, there's a whole load of these admixture percentage charts that you can get. They've got a whole range. They don't, I, I don't find they mean very much, but some people seem to really like playing with the work of these. DNA GEDCOM is another very useful website which has got some useful tools. Um, there's this, one of the most useful is this ADSA um, autosomal DNA segment analyzer. And this is very useful for visualizing these pileup zones. So here you can, see, this will accept family finder data or my heritage data. And you can see here on my chromosome one, I've all these people piled up on this one particular part of the uh, chromosome there. And this is interactive, you can click on the, the names of the matches and then send an email directly within this interface. The other very useful feature about um, DNA, DNA GEDCOM is this DNA GEDCOM client. Um, this is a subscription service which is $5 a month. But this uh, Ancestry don't allow you to download your match list, which is one thing I'd really like from Ancestry, um, because it's just very helpful to have that information in a spreadsheet. And with the DNA GEDCOM client, you can do that, um, and you can get the information about the um, shared CMs, number of segments, and also the, all the family tree information as well. So that's very useful. And it's actually much easier, I find, sometimes just sorting through on a spreadsheet, trying to find the matches, than trying to um, navigate through the search system there. Another site you can try is DNA Land. This is actually a scientific research project. And they are, they've provided lots of tools for people to use um, so that, um, to tempt them to join the database and then you can contribute your results to, for research purposes. They're now up to 64,000 users when I last did this uh, screenshot. And they get, one nice feature, right, they do have a matching database. I still don't have any matching matches at, in their database. But they have this nice feature where they try and divide the matches up into recent and ancient segments, which I think is uh, interesting. And then they also have these um, trait reports, so eye colour and uh, various other things. You have, just have to answer a little questionnaire and then you get these reports given to you. And one final one I wanted to mention is Genome Mate Pro. Um, this is not one that I use, but there are some, a, a lot of people seem to think this is really good. It apparently has a very steep learning curve, but it will allow you to um, collate all your match data. If you've tested at multiple companies, you can put it all in this database and you can do all sorts of fancy analysis uh, with it. Um, so finally, just to finish off, um, resources, ISOG is the, the main resource for genetic genealogy, there's a, a wiki, there is a portal in the wiki on autosomal DNA where you'll find lots of very, very useful articles, and there's a Facebook group, and there are all, there's now a whole host of genetic genealogy mailing lists that you might want to try. Um, a lot of the useful advice is coming through the Facebook groups now and, through, and also on some of the blogs. And I have a blog that you can follow as well when I have time to, to write. Um, so there are lots and lots of people out there who can help. Um, and we're all in this sort of process of learning together how these tests work and trying to find out how to uh, make the most out of autosomal DNA. So I think I've covered everything I want to do, so I don't know if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much, Debbie Hammer. <laughs> any questions for Debbie? Yeah, we have another one. Thank you very much, Debbie. That was very interesting. Uh, I was contacted by a lady who transferred her uh, autosomal results from Ancestry to FTDNA and then headed my family finder match list. 
that's kind of, we know we have a geographical association. What I don't understand is that she subsequently then transferred her daughter's results, and her daughter is now my number one match. As far as I know, the father is not Irish, no geographical location at all. How, how might that have happened? So you say the daughter has more, shares more DNA with you than the mother? Yes. Right, that can happen. Um, I found, when I, I did a comparison of my results at Ancestry DNA, and I found in that comparison, 20 of my matches actually shared DNA with both my mother and with my father. And I had one person I found who shared quite a large segment of DNA with my mother, and then another large segment of DNA with my father. I only matched one of those, uh, one of that cup, one, I only matched on one of those segments. So without testing my parents, I wouldn't have known that I also had the match on the other side. Um, and another reason that could happen is that Ancestry have this timber algorithm where they downweight these pilot regions. So if the match happened to fall within a pilot region, um, it could be that um, the, the CM count is lower at Ancestry than it is at Family Tree DNA. But I would take the Ancestry CM count to be more reliable because they, um, they, they do more fancy stuff with their matching to, to, to actually make sure it's a good match. Mm -hmm. Questions for Debbie? Yep, Patty, we got one here. Should I be skeptical of a my heritage match with 358 shared century mortgages, or are they just worthy of a close, those close relationships like first and second cousins? Um, the, the one I saw recently was a second cousin match where that showed up with all the other companies and didn't show up at my heritage. But I would hope that the close matches are reliable. Um, I'm sure they will get their system sorted in due course. Um, I also heard that Living DNA will be accepting free transfers uh, from other companies by the end of this year. It was going to be February, wasn't it, this year? But they seem to have put back the date, yes. Yeah, so I've heard that by the end of the year we should also yeah. be able right. to transfer our data, whether it's Ancestry or Family Tree DNA, to Living DNA as well. Question here. Representation. So imagine that your billion ancestors, it's just giving you a representation of those billion ancestors and roughly where they're from. So um, that, it, that they are that reliable at, beyond the continental level. So Irish people tend to have higher percentages of Irish, but I come up as 20% Irish in ancestry and I only have one Irish great 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 grandmother. But there's been a lot of mixing between England and Ireland, so lots of English people went to Ireland in the 1600s, um, and it's not—it's very difficult to distinguish between um, English and, and um, Irish, or even you know, like English and German. So a lot of uh, German people come with high percentages of English, and uh, French and English again is also very difficult to distinguish between. So I, I wouldn't put too much regard to those. The genetic communities of ancestry are very reliable. And if you're in a community for West Kerry, even if you haven't got any West Kerry ancestors, you can probably be pretty certain you've got some ancestry, recent ancestry from West Kerry. Uh, so I would go by those rather than the, these bald percentages. Great question. Yes, we have a question here at the back. I'm going to come down to you. And hopefully I can avoid these and loudspeakers. <laughs> Thank you, unfortunately, I missed the first part of the lecture. But my query is on Ancestry.com. The other day, I got in a first and a second cousin, whom I have no idea who it is whatsoever, and neither have they. Is there any way I can solve that problem as to who that person is or where the problem came from? Well, this is where we have to go back to the genealogical research. Um, you missed the bit at the beginning where I was saying that DNA is now revealing lots of surprises and unexpected relationships. So clearly you have a fairly recent um, ancestor in your, or one of you has an ancestor in your family tree who had a child that 
nobody knew nothing about. Um, so you can you can narrow these down sometimes by testing other people. Sorry about that. I don't know what it's but it's getting interference on our speakers. Sorry, go. Uh, yes, it's, it's a question of going back to the genealogical research and you can narrow it down by testing other people and maybe if you can identify an even closer relation, like as a possible first cousin, to see if they share the same the amount of DNA expected for a first cousin relationship. Um, but it's, it's all down to the genealogical research. The DNA on its own is not actually that helpful. It's the combination of the DNA with the genealogy that uh, is, is how we get the answers. If you test somebody on your mother's side of the family, and test somebody on your father's side of the family, you might be able to narrow it down to one particular side. Yeah. It is on my mother's side, I know that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Great question. And we have a question in here. Yeah. I would like very much to determine the fines and matches on my mother's side. However, I was not able to have her match. I mean, Tessa. Uh, she was an only child, and her father was an only child. And on her uh, mother's side, there were only a few uh, siblings that had children. How can I determine of these thousands of matches I have who might be related on my mother's side? So have you been able to test people on your father's side? Yes. Um, so well, all you can do is test as many people on that side of the family as, as possible uh -huh. uh, and just do the genealogical research so that you've got the names and the, and the surnames. Um, you, can, uh, you can sort of sometimes infer from the matches on your father. Have you, have you been able to test your father or an uncle? No, no. Um, I mean, there are no uncles. Right. Well, my parents were all my children. Right, it, it is more difficult in that case, um, but the, again, the more, if you can test as many second cousins, third cousins as you can on both sides, um, that will help to give you a framework. Right. So there's no other way to do that? No, there isn't, no. But, but as, as the databases grow, you're going to get more of these close cousins matching anyway, just by chance, without having to go out and recruit them. And hopefully, if you get, say, like a third cousin, you should be able to tie that in just from genealogy research. Okay, great. <laughs> great. Okay, well, we have to uh, end the question there, I'm afraid. But Debbie will be around for the rest of the day. And if anybody wants to ask Debbie questions, then uh, uh, you, Debbie, will be outside of the uh, yes. family tree DNA stand, which is just outside us. There's lots of volunteers there as well. So if you have any particular questions about DNA, um, please go to the family tree DNA stand and ask some of the volunteers there. There's also, of course, lots of volunteers at the ancestry stand as well, and we also have my heritage here. So there's lots of free information. But uh, for now, uh, thank you very much, Debbie Kenner. ancestry and family tree and that if um, for a woman you're not doing the one with the Y chromosome yeah. so it's really a choice between you, you elect for one or the other but for a woman which of them is more ancestry or the family tree so 